Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining this session. My name is Samarth Gupta, and as Varun introduced me, I'll be actually taking you through the uh, concept of industrial design and visualization before I uh, give it to hand it over to my colleague uh, Uji. So uh, let's actually uh, start with a with a with a slide, which which would uh, you know uh, take you back uh, in into uh, memory lane. Uh, there was a time not long ago where, uh, you know, we Indians actually grew up to become uh, engineers and doctors because everything was straight uh, in, in terms of our career path in our lives. There was no uh, risk taking and uh, the key to a successful career was very, very pre-planned. And that actually was quite reflective of the way we used to design. If you look at the car uh, on the, on the uh, top left, uh, this is iconic Maruti 800, which was quite successful. Uh, everything is straight. Everything is uh, pure in terms of shape. Everything is straight and very uh, predictive. Okay, the designers are not very adventurous. But if you see the similar uh, from the similar company, you have a car called uh, Berlino, and 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 this car has actually uh, is is appealing to the modern day uh, people because. The Indian car market has come uh, of age today, and we have the best in class uh, models available to us. Uh, some of these cars are actually designed elsewhere, but these cars are actually designed, keeping in mind the Indians uh, who are the consumers uh, for this. So this is actually reflective of where the society is moving, uh, where we are moving as, as human beings, as people. Uh, we have, if you see, uh, as I actually started my presentation by the career path, the example of a career path, uh, previously we had, uh, we had only doctors, we want to become doctors and engineers, but now you can see in the market, everyone, not many actually want to become doctors and engineers. There are so many tech startups, there are so many uh, career paths that people, uh, you know, choose. And because that actually reflects how bold they think, how how they can actually stand without uh, anyone's support, the spirit of pioneering. And that is actually too reflective in the designs. So I'm just taking car and as an example, you can see that the design of a car is so fluidic. It is actually so uh, futuristic and it actually shows that the car is uh, making its uh, presence felt uh, to, the, to the audience. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, happening because there are some market forces which are which are influencing design. I'll just come to the point where where I'll just uh, discuss about design. But before that, I'll just take you uh, through this example. Uh, this is uh, BMW, uh, uh, you know, model i8, uh, and and this is a very interesting example of how the uh, trends uh, have reversed. Now, previously, uh, when we were actually designing stuff. Uh, manufacturing processes were uh, governing the designs or they were actually constraining the designs. Uh, but now the reverse has happened. Now the, the advancements in the manufacturing processes are actually shaping the way designers are designing cars. Uh, in this particular example, uh, the need for light weighting of the car led designers to adopt this layering theme. Okay. And this was uh, uh, this could be made possible because uh, it was supported by the advancements in new materials and manufacturing techniques like uh, 3d printing composites all of these techniques which are now available uh, very easily and very cheaply to the to the designers have has led them to design something which actually is aligned to the manufacturing processes so this is a very interesting example because no more the designers are getting constrained by the manufacturing processes. In fact, they are getting inspiration from the manufacturing processes. Let me start with a very interesting uh, uh, case study of uh, the evolution of uh, telephone design. And by now, you must have actually uh, got a hang of you know what in which direction I'm uh, taking you. Uh, so let's talk about phone. Now, over the course of uh, uh, history, the, the telephone has experienced a great number of transformations. It is one of the contemporary uh, objects that uh, that has inspired artists and designers to do something new. Uh, 
the first example that you see is from the 1960s i think this was this is a uh, this is this was designed by some italian company in 1960s but if you can actually observe uh, closely it's it's design uh, it has a two tone uh, uh, you know color one for the, for the cradle and one for the headset now that actually elicits and that actually evokes certain type of interest or certain type of emotions okay but now if you see in 1990s the whole design philosophy is uh, is uh, taking a huge shift uh, this is an example of uh, of a uh, uh, phone which is again coming from italy and it is taking inspiration by the cosmos with its smooth uh, rounded edges uh, and quite reflective surfaces which is actually quite uh, you know it's showing that how uh, how the society was moving in in those times it actually is quite uh, representative of how people used to like objects everything was round everything was uh, you know very simplistic but everything had something to do with the space age and as the new millennium approach in 2000s uh, i don't know any one of you have uh, missed this phone uh, this is the nokia 3310 and it became the phone for the masses uh, now this phone had a great engineering quality uh, at a very at, at cheaper cost and it also enjoyed the reputation of being indestructible so the shift from aesthetic uh, the shift happened from being a, only the aesthetic design to something which is more durable something which is more cheap but still it does the job so the way people perceive products changed from something purely aesthetic to something which also uh, you know uh, performs a function and everything changed after 2007 uh, when uh, when uh, App, uh, steve jobs uh, launched apple uh, apple's iphone uh, and it and he brought uh, the design technological and cultural uh, revolution uh, to the world uh, he gave the world a wider ipod a uh, uh, advanced phone and something which uh, on which you can actually surf internet and nothing actually remained the same after that now you can see in 2020 we have iphone 10 11 12 13 and it keep, the list will keep on going the idea is that he invented a desire a in a desire to touch everything and and this is quite uh, reflective of how we uh, perceive design because even if if we have iphone 8 today or iphone 10 today we'll still line up outside the apple store to buy its latest product because we want more we have this uh, you know undeniable hunger to uh, you know please our senses so i think that might have actually you know set the tone of what design is all about and even if you look uh, at the at your surroundings or the world around you you are actually surrounded by objects okay now those objects are actually designed by someone and those objects are designed keeping in mind uh, your your dreams your aspirations because aspirations they make a product successful uh, some of the examples that i can share is like uh, you can see the london route master bus which has been recently discontinued but till i think 3 uh, 4 years back it was still a design uh, which was quite pleasing to look at because the designers of this bus actually design something which can please the senses of its users or the commuters in this case similarly juicy sal all these are very iconic uh, objects like the lse kettle uh, the ipod i mean all these things apart from the functions that they perform they also are uh, you know what you call the objects of desire people want to own them because they want because they are uh, representative of the Uh, of the brand image or you know the the fashion statement this is the computer we used to use uh, in the in the late 90s uh, a cpu a box a monitor a mouse a keyboard when apple launched imac in 1998 it actually uh, you know uh, led apple to profitability it actually was quite profitable uh, for apple because the product this object that apple created sold like anything i think they sold uh, 
close to 1 million uh, objects or 1 million IMAX in the first four months. And why? Why could, could they manage to do uh, such a huge uh, or make us such a huge impact? Because every piece of IMAX was designed keeping the users in mind. They wanted to give its users a different experience, a different feeling. Not a single line of, of IMAC was straight. Everything was curved or rounded. Uh, the use of materials was totally different. I mean, I'm, I'm, and I'm talking of 1998 where the PC was like uh, dull as a doornail. Holographic stickers, everything was uh, controlled by, by, your, uh, by your keyboard. I mean, everything was so different because it added a new dimension to the way, the new experience to the way you used to use PC. And that actually led to its success. So design apart from aesthetics is also, uh, uh, you know, a lot about how you use that object or how you use that service or how you use that product. And Dieter Rams, one of, I don't know uh, how many of you know Dieter Rams and have uh, seen its uh, objects because they are not launched in India, but he actually said once that you cannot understand good design if you do not understand the people who are using it. And that is quite reflective of their design philosophy. It was very clean. It was very simple. They actually tried to do what no one could ever imagine. They actually converted simple objects into design objects so that people love to watch, people love, love to look at their, uh, you know, the products that they would create or products which they could uh, design for the masses. Uh, this is one of the example of, uh, of, of a radio that they designed in 1955 and look at the year 1955 it is still looking so uh, contemporary why because it is designed for human senses human human requirements human uh, you know perception of design hasn't changed much uh, the only thing that has changed is the trends and uh, it is not limited to objects and uh, products of daily life uh, design is everywhere as i said uh, uh, it's true that architecture can also uh, move us. It can, uh, uh, you know, it plays a very important part in uh, bringing back memories. And, uh, you know, it, it can also elicit strong emotions, maybe intimidating or maybe comforting. Like, for example, many people maybe may get intimidated by using, by seeing this, uh, this structure. But many of them could actually relate to uh, this structure and may, you know, start loving it. Uh, and... You can go to any building, you know, the, the, every building has got a facade and every building has got a facade with a certain color. Now, the, if you see this facade of a building, you know, it, you can actually, uh, you know, point or object that, you know, this is a very simple design. It has got nothing. It has just uh, plain, plain windows uh, and, and crisscross windows like a checkered box, but it is still a design. Uh, you know, it can actually, you know, evoke emotions. It can, it can, it can, it can touch your senses. Uh, and definitely the colors also play a huge role because every color is representative of your, it actually directly controls your emotions. Some of, some of us may be, you know, liking blue or some of us may get intimidated by red, so on and so forth. So design is, is uh, covering every aspect of your uh, senses. The same uh, holds true for, for office design. When you enter office, when you sit inside a room, you know, the, your surroundings actually play a very important part because everything around you, the design of everything around you actually uh, defines how you, how you, you know, feel and how you interact uh, with, based on your surroundings. This is also example of uh, one of our offices. And if you look at this image, the first thing that comes to your mind is the very uh, different looking chairs, you know, a mesh of chairs, a mesh uh, design chairs, and you have the lights on the ceiling. So everything looks very, looks in a, in a harmony. If, it, if you see the composition of this image, it looks in a harmony. And that is what we, we look at when we, when we actually, you know, think of design as the complete design in a complete picture. It's not about the design of a chair or design of, of, a, of a ceiling. It is about the design, the entire picture of uh, uh, that, that we are actually looking at. So uh, I have not taken much time because uh, I need to also you know, pass on to UG. So what we have discussed in this uh, uh, small presentation was 
what is good design, why we desire for good design, and how design can affect our moods, and how technology help us create good designs. And I actually will now, uh, you know, hand it over to my colleague uh, Yuji, who will actually, you know, touch base and who will also uh, discuss about the hands-on uh, Fusion 360 and how you can achieve good designs uh, using this technology. Yuji, uh, Yuji, over to you. Thank you, Samas. Uh, can you stop sharing the screen so that I could share mine? Right. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, looks good, QG. Looks good? Hold on. Let me make a presentation. Is this the right one or the other one? This looks good. Yeah, this is the one. Looks good. All right. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yuji. I'm making this uh, virtual conference or workshop uh, from Japan, obviously from my home, stay home. Uh, all right, so today I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, Fusion 360 visualization. Uh, how Samas describes that the design has a very unique uh, part of it and uh, it's really the way that people find the communication and similarity of what you like, what you feel, what you get out of this product, you know, through the value, you know. And in, in Fusion 360, which is a 3D software, you know, although it's not going to design automatically the, how easy the product is going to be held or used, but at least, you know, with this uh, function that I'm talking about today, rendering will give you the essence of how you visualize your idea, your design, and you would like to communicate with other people about your ideas. And then I'm going to um, give you some idea how you can make your rendering look good in Fusion 360. All right, so today uh, this uh, session name is Rendering uh, Realism for Professional Visualized uh, Visual uh, Compositions. So there are a couple of techniques other than just knowing the functions or commands and I'm going to uh, give you some lessons, probably like five or seven uh, sessions of techniques. And just introducing myself, I'm Yuji, and my background is industrial designing uh, designer. And um, I've been you know, using renderings or 3D CAD more than 20 years. If I think about it, the first time I uh, touched with the 3D software was when I was 18. I'm 40, almost 41. Amazing, but uh, so um, I know a lot of techniques so I can share everything I know with you guys. So uh, just before I'm going to talk about the techniques, I am going to show you some of the work that I did in Fusion 360. So here are the data of the train rendered and actually this was rendered in DRED, which is a professional uh, rendering software that Autodesk has because back then I was VRED technical specialist. So I created this data in Fusion 360 and I took the data to the VRED and some has actually maybe seen this data because I was a VRED tech specialist back then. And then this was fully done in Fusion in modeling and the renderings. And it was a concept flyer for uh, one of my friend requested this image because he's gonna do some startups. And then as you can see, you know, rendering is about, it's almost like a vision, how you plan to make your product come true. You know, you want to make people to believe in your concept. This is what I want. Do you buy it or not? You know, so uh, being realistic about in rendering is very important, I believe, because, uh, you know, seeing is believing people say, it, right? Like you can describe however you want to, uh, however you want, you know, about your products. But seeing is always giving big impact to your customer or someone you're sharing your um, ideas. All right, this is another concept work I have done with my friend, which is uh, carrying the natural gas from Hawaii to Japan or something like that. You know, it's a sea drone, so there's no one on board, but he wanted to see some clear, cool images that, you know, uh, he's going to present this, his idea to the uh, venture capitalists and all the people. So I designed it and I created it in Fusion, including modeling, and the renderings, probably this one took me six hours. So it's just one day job. 
you know so fusion is quite easy you know uh, you know you probably require some practice in modeling and renderings but uh, once you get it you can create you know your own idea and design in short amount of time uh, sorry. So this was another visual that I created, you know, to make people believe that this thing is on the ocean, you know, and it's carrying the gas by itself, you know. All right. So here are the, uh, some subjects that I'm going to cover, you know, my agenda, basic understanding of rendering, 3D modeling preparations, material touch and environment preparation, creating contrast to have a better rendering visual and a composition is very important. I know maybe some of you enjoy taking photos with iPhone or professional camera. You know, composition is always very interesting things. You're taking, same, uh, taking the photo with same settings, but just because of the angle is different, you know, how you see the world is different, the photo quality is completely different. So the composition is very important and hopefully little touch up. So the first thing is basic understanding of rendering. What is renderings? What, why we do this, right? And uh, a rendering function in Fusion is very easy to use. Maybe if you take 15 minutes, 30 minutes uh, hands-on training course, you probably cover most of the uh, functions and command what I mean. And, but all right, technically, what you do is you make 3D data and you change your work environment to renderings to have a data. And why you do the rendering image? Because like I keep on saying, uh, to share your vision to the others. This is what I want to make. What do you think? This is what I'm going to produce. Do you, do you buy it? This is the color I like. Do you like it? You know, this is the material I'm thinking of using. Do you agree? There are so many ways that you can communicate, you know, with the people through the renderings. So that's the, uh, that's the reason why you, you should have a good rendering, right? So some of you may be already using Fusion 360 for a while, maybe a year or two, three years, I don't know. But maybe you're going to say, I know how to use rendering in Fusion 360. It's easy. I agree with you. It's easy. But knowing command is not, you know, a key essence of how you create good rendering. That's my point, you know, throughout all my sessions. So I say, wait, right? Knowing rendering commands does not mean that you know how to create a good rendering. So what you need to know is, you know, having a good 3D model, good material, good environment, good contrast, good composition. You need to cover all these five essences to have a good rendering. So I'm starting from a 3D model uh, preparations, right? So left and right, well, it's a locomotive, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a old school train. And obviously one on the left, you might feel that it's almost like a toy-ish. And the one on the right looks like kind of like a professional engineer made it or modeled it. You know, the difference is clear, right? Details, how realistic the data is built. This really reflects on the rendering quality because being realistic on the 3D model itself is also going to provide you to have a realistic rendering. Super simple, right? And then also the one on the left from the Fusion user perspective, you might think that, oh, okay, maybe this person is a still beginner. He just or she just start using Fusion. It's, I'm not saying that's bad. You know, it's just the stages where you at, right? And the one on the right, obviously it doesn't look like a beginner's job. It's somebody using Fusion for like six months or year, you know, so the quality really shows and reflects, right? And then it's clear. So also uh, one thing I would like you to spend a little bit of time and care is the detail part. You know, the one on the left is, you can probably say this is a shape. It's more like a volume of the form, you know, what, however you want to describe it. One on the middle has a little bit of a touch up. You know, it has the little fillets going on. It has a little like a part line going on. It looks like a, a product or start to form like real products. 
versus one on the right, you know, adding more detail will definitely create making the product look like a real product. Well, think about it. This is a still 3D model. It doesn't have a material. I don't know which material this is. Wood, plastic, metal, I don't know. I don't know what the side piece is going to do. So everything is still unknown, but look like already being realistic. And I have seen so many fusion renderings in Fusion 360 galleries. And a lot of people do not have a fillet on the model, which is going to be end up being towards on the left side, basic volume. You know, I want you to focus on take, taking your model, your data towards right side. And I hope you see the clear difference right here. And this is the one that I took the data to the uh, uh, rendering environment. Still do not have the, any materials and fancy environments, anything like that. But it's already been clear that less one is kind of like old school computer graphic, right? Looks like computer graphics, super sharp edge, you know? The one in the middle, yeah, need a bit more push, I said, right? This uh, third one is getting realistic, obviously. So adding fillets on every little corner really increase the realist, uh, reality or being realistic. So if you have a smartphone, I want you to just pay attention. Like for example, my iPhone right here, iPhone has a camera, iPhone has a, a little like buttons, you know, or it doesn't have to be iPhone. It could be your smartphone. You know, it has a little button. I want you to just see and clear, you know, it looks sharp, but it has a tiny, tiny bit of fillet. Otherwise people would cut their fingers. That's the, you know, fact being realistic. Okay. And then also the, uh, when you make a 3D model, I want you to just pay attention about the contrast between where it has lots of details, and other area has left a little bit more clean, open, flat. And these contrasts being detailed and being flat and open, you know, will, has, will give you or give products a good sense of contrast being realistic about, you know. Um, all right, the third one is that setting up the materials, all right? Uh, just for you to know, Fusion has a two different materials. One on the left is more like a color, you know, based. And the one on the right is more like a texture based. You know, uh, in the reality, in this whole world, you know, you find so many variety of different type of material. Even you just say metal. Metal has a, so many different kinds of metal. And metal has so many different type of finish, right? So the plastic, so the wood, so the fabric, a lot of different material has a different finish, right? But in Fusion, you know, it's quite simple that it has either color-based or texture-based material. You need to know and then you need to see the difference between them. And then you can uh, apply the materials from clicking this uh, like wheel of fortune kind of color wheel, all right? And then here's a model. And then I am going to click on the uh, color palettes, almost like a, a one is called a, a appearance. And then you will find a lot of uh, pre-made uh, materials in Fusion 360 uh, material rivalry. And then you just grab one and drag the material over to your 3D data. And that's it. And now this top part has the, what you call it, paint, enamel, glossy red material to it. Yeah. So this is what I mean by it's sort of like a color based. It doesn't say it's metal underneath it or it doesn't say it's wood underneath it. It doesn't matter. For right now, this is a paint finish. Okay. And then you can also add the material on top of uh, rivalry, which is called in this design, you are going to use this library, right? And here's a technique that you can actually choose color of your design. There's so many different type of products in this whole world, but please, uh, at the beginning, I recommend you to keep it simple. You probably need to choose either whatever the color you would like to use, red, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, violet, whatever you, uh, the, whichever the one that you'd like it, you know, then, 
please uh, probably do not mix it too much with other colors, right? Colors are very tricky. As long as you keep it simple, what I mean by using white or black or gray with one color, that would keep your product very simple. I will show you the example. One on the left is the one I chose, you know? I'm not the color coordinator, you know, color expert, but you know, I can keep it simple and it looks good enough to me. But while on the right, I, I'm, I'm doing this on purpose, obviously, but I was just trying to put random color here and there, so many of them. Then it's a, uh, it's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a terrible because some people might like it, but I'll say the character on the right is too strong. You know, you will probably limit people, you know, you know, number of the, uh, the people who probably like this color combination. Yeah. So keep it simple. And also I want you to pay attention about the value or amount that how much you mix the color, right? The one on the left and one on the right has a color and the black or gray scheme. And, but the mixture of the color in ratio is a 60% of the object has a color to it. And as 40% of the object has a black or gray. But uh, maybe on the right, the train, you know, you have 85% of red and maybe 15% of white or gray or black. But you still call it like red train, right? One on the left, you know, whatever, like uh, one of those, like uh, a nail gun, whatever. And you probably say the yellow nail gun. So, you know, color um, has a, a quite a lot of power uh, depending on however you use it, right? So on my airplane, it's a, a good question. Is this orange airplane? Mm, technically, it's more like a, a black, right? I said black, but with the orange highlight. I like that way. I always like my product to be either white or black or gray with color highlight, okay? All right, next subject is the texture. Now I talked about a lot of, you know, thing in colors, but now I would like to show you some things that you need to pay attention for the texture. Fusion has a texture materials and the one that give you all these like a bumpy faces, you know, or some textures to it. And one thing you need to really watch out using texture um, material is the direction or, or how texture is flow into your design. Right? This is the brushed aluminum, but you need to pay attention how real products should be brushed. You know what I mean? And then this is the carbon fiber. Looks fancy and expensive, looks good. But if you do not uh, change your settings, you know, it's going to create quite a lot of mess. So I'm going to follow one more time, click on the appearance window, select the carbon fiber materials, you know, it's either textured or uh, the other ones, right? And within the texture materials, you double click this, uh, in this design window, you have a thumbnail of material, you double click this part and it will give you a more detailed control, okay? Let's see. And then you can change the material like a uh, depth or like refraction amount or like uh, orientations and all these things you can uh, change and arrange actually within the material details, okay? And here's another map. Te uh, technically texture map, texture material is using these photo images. You know, this is the uh, uh, JPEG image or TIFF images. And then you can, you are actually tiling up you know, just like a floor tile, you tile up images so that it will continue uh, to become a carbon fiber, for example, all right? So let's go. Uh, so there's another one called texture con uh, map control. This is very important. After you apply carbon fiber material, you should click on the texture map control and select the object. And then uh, under the uh, options, it has a projection type. This is very uh, important and you need to pay attention. Right now, do you see the example right here where a, you see, you, you can probably see the seam line right here, right? You shouldn't see the carbon fiber break line right here, but unless you change this from automatic to something else, you will see the themes. 
this isn't looking realistic, right? Not good. So here's an example, bad example, all right? I apply the fillet on a 3D model, and then I apply the carbon fiber materials exactly where fillet is modeled. You see the big thing that looks like complete fake, right? So you need to uh, change this uh, projection type to spherical, for example. Hey, no seam, right? It looks good on that corner, but with the same setting, you just turn around your model, you see the different part of the model. But now you see, you know, now it's creating complete mess. So depending on the angle that you are going to create rendering, you need to play with this projection type. You need to change it, right? So now I'm going to change the projection type to the box. You see, now it became okay again, right? Now it looks like a seamless carbon fiber, right? And then you can also have a, a, this manipulator to control the angle of the texture, right? You, whether you want to have it diagonal, or vertical, you control it, right? And by the way, the little technique, if you know, already know Fusion 360 renderings, uh, maybe you didn't recognize there's a small thumbnail right here. You can actually change the shape of the material. So in case you are using different type of carbon fiber or in case you're using five different type of red paint, you can uh, change the uh, thumbnail so that you remember, oh, this one goes to the body, you know, or this one goes to the, uh, I don't know, interior part, whatever. You can differentiate that, right? It's just good to know. So the fourth one is the environment settings, which is going to give you a good um, power to the renderings. The world is surrounding completely different environments like water or inside house or outside house, on the street, above the sky, uh, never been but outer space if you want to. So um, whatever the project, uh, product you're holding in your hand is also surrounded environment right and by mimicking uh, the environment the project object is going to be more realistic uh, right now i am uh, putting placing this uh, three sample boxes over a uh, thin uh, environment image called field so in the middle of field there are three boxes super clear and then you know it's almost realistic by itself by being in the real uh, by in, being the environment Lather and placed on white space. You know, although there is some studio shot, I know that one, but uh, you know, by surround this, surrounded this realistic environment, product will shine. All right, uh, to change the environment setting, you need to go to like the uh, scene settings and click this tab called environment library. And Infusion 360 offer you uh, free environments as a default so that you can select whatever pre-installed environments, right? Or you can actually go look for your environment to something that you are thinking of or having the vision with, right? Car is running on the street. Car never get parked inside a room. Car never get parked in probably the outer space. You need to find the right environment and you can actually download it for free from a website called uh, HDRI Haven. Yes, good name. You know, or you can actually purchase professional quality HDRI image from website like HDRI locations. It costs probably 50 US dollar per images you can actually buy. Or third one is you create your own HDRI environment. You probably know the Insta360, Insta360 Pro, Insta360 Titan, which is gonna cost you 12,000 US dollars, but you know, better quality, better HDLI. It's just, it's super clear. So this is the difference. So the quality of HDLI in, environment image photo uh, being 1,000, 1K, right? So half of the full HD is on the left. So this is like 16K images reflecting on 3D model. So it's super clear how it looks different. So better quality photo, better quality rendering, right? So this is me being, this is by the way, Japan. 
you know, there's an area, you know, we call Totori has a desert in the middle of nowhere. And then I took this Insta360 to take photos, right? And I took the image to the Photoshop. And there's two, only two things you need to do. Change your image mode to 32-bit and export or save as, you know, your image as HDR, you know, right here on a, on a options, file format option. And that's it. And then you can actually import that customized HDRI images, you know, to your Fusion environment. I'm going to show you in a minute. So not from the library, I choose replace custom environment button right here. By the way, that's too small. Uh, sorry about that. And I hit on it. I select my custom own HDRI environment, Ta da right? So I imported my own photo to Fusion scene. And right now I haven't clicked any option. So I am going to click flatten ground option. Now seems like the photo is too big. So I'm going to reposition and change the ground scale smaller and smaller, smaller to match with whatever the object size you are making with, right? So now it's coming, it's coming up. And now you see me standing up, right? Taking photos, but you know, just like this, you can take your own custom photo with 300 or 500 Insta360 camera and you can customize your environment. Imagine whatever the object you're creating, jewelry, package design, you know, being in environment is already a power to the renderings, okay? So here are, here's another setting that you may want to probably think about. You know, one on the left is that probably things like a, a, you, you see images in catalogs or auto show. And one on the right is being in a realistic environment. You know, realistically speaking, one on the right is being more realistic, but to understand the form, to understand the shape of it, Probably one on the left is easier to see because it doesn't have additional unnecessary reflection running on the right. So being realistic and being real on the form, you know, is different ideas, okay? So whichever you like to show, you know, ideally you would like to show both being environment, being in the products, right? And then I went to auto show one time and I saw a huge, huge ceiling lights on the Matsuda booth. And then I really liked the reflection. So I took this color line and then painted over uh, Photoshop, right? And uh, on my own HDLI, I copy paste and I blushed it and I created this. And then I will show you the difference. One on the left, no touch up on the environment. One on the right, I customized. Uh, in, in Photoshop for one minute, right? And then you are going to see two different renderings when, in the next slide, right? And I want you to remember this. One on the left is using this one. All right, just like this. But just by adding one minute touch up, you see how dramatic that it gets, right? So this is the power of environment. You know, it's completely different feel to it. This looks far more sharp, you know, and you see good reflections. And I like the effect, right? And then also when you do make renderings over 2D photo, I recommend you to try render background entirely green, just like a Hollywood Bollywood movies. You know, when you composite uh, rendering scene to the real world, you have a blue screen or green screen. I don't know, however you call it. And then actually this is a Chicago uh, in, in United States. And I render this and I import that to the Photoshop and I, I use this filter thingy, you know, to remove every green background from the image. Yeah, I, you know, I can say like, you know, a little bit of touch up needed, but uh, it's super simple. You know, whatever this box is, by the way. So that, you know, I designed this uh, electrical bicycle. I went to Photoshop and here's the image I created. So you will see how you match up with a real photo, real photo with a rendered image, yes? And by the way, uh, in the middle of the demo movie, I clicked the uh, flatten ground. These are the difference that you are getting, right? With that, unless you check this, you are making renderings, uh, environment or scene like this. 
there's no ground level. And then there's a ground plane with flattened ground will make your background, um, hidden background uh, shape look like this bread shape, you know? So now you see the uh, floor and it's, it's gonna create a shadow, nice uh, shadow cast it, okay? So the using prop is also recommended. Here's a ship I modeled in Fusion, right? I wanted to create renderings. I wanna create rendering of the ship, but not on the floor or anything. I wanna have rendering over the, uh, the ocean. So I visited this website called TurboSquid to buy props, you know, out of these millions of rivalry. The prop that I bought is the ocean 3D data. So now I can take this ocean data to my Fusion to create this type of rendering. This is render fully in Fusion. And this is a 2D rendering, then there's no way I can animate that. But thank God for a great app called uh, uh, a Pixar Roop. There's a, a smartphone app called Pixar Roop where you can just, uh, uh, just touch up, you know, some of the lines or you can draw some of the line to the way you want to animate your photo, right? Uh, maybe you sh I recommend you to just check with Pixar, uh, Pixar Roop. Uh, it's really fun too, and it works really well for the renderings, okay? So here's another rendering I created. I show, you know, just because of the time sake, I'm going to skip the movie, but this is fully 3D data. The oceans and the bottom face, everything is just 3D data, right? So it's really nice, even the little tiny fish, you know, and it's gonna help me create in the realistic image, okay? So play with the contrast. I already spoke about this. Think about wherever the detail and the flat plane is going to be. And then that will give you highly detailed area, plain area, highly detailed area. And that would make product more clean, nice, you know, simple, but yet realistic. Okay. And also play with the material contrast, matte texture over highly reflective, uh, reflective materials. That is really high good contrast, all right? And also maybe background contrast and object contrast maybe needs to be high or maybe some area needs to have a similar contrast. It's just a matter of how you play with it, right? And a composition finding is also a key. I want you to just have a spend time looking over whatever the photogra photographer is saying. Photographer is the master of the finding composition, okay? And I'm going to show you some uh, uh, composition. Here it is. So here's uh, uh, um, I, uh, this original idea. I took it from a car poster or car catalog uh, from Porsche or something like that, right? It, the, the existing car company had a really nice rendering. And I just took the composition exactly the same way, organized it. I really like this horizontal calm layout with really uh, strong diagonal direction with a floor texture to it. You know, even this little tiny corner. This is a layout. This is a, a composition, right? So main body parallel to the frame. Frame means this window, right? And there's another uh, wooden floor going across, right? And there's a, a flame, you know, of the wood deck you know, running close. It's still diagonal, 90, uh, 90 degree. And this one is really powerful. And then, although I cannot show you other example today, but if you uh, go to the website and see the car, car wallpaper or something like that, do some search, you will find similar contrast. All right, here's another one, you know, my design airplane. This one has the main body sort of like going diagonal, right? And then there's another diagonal line across. And then I want to have one parallel element, you know, along with this flame. And where I put it, I put it right here. So that was my rendering, right? Some mixture of a parallel essence and a diagonal essence, however you lay up. Also, I want you to know the, these two images, arranging or placing object in horizontal manner or per, uh, per, uh, what's it called like orthographic view is totally uh, giving you different image. One on the left is more like active, dynamic, aggressive, speedy. You know, one on the right is more like subtle, calm, still, solid, you know, different feeling. And this is very important. I want you to play 
with the background, like negative space, sometimes it's called, or open space, you know, negative space is super important to support your vision. You know, one on the left has much more open area on the top. And because the car is on the bottom uh, side of the image or frame, it looks like uh, it's on the ground. It looks like heavy, relaxed, open. One on the light, maybe you can say that it's more focused or it looks bigger in the frame or bigger in the product is, or it's more like a close, too tight, I don't know. So this is also uh, things that you need to pay attention and you have to have full control. You're not gonna let this thing happen by accident. You're the one deciding how many white space you are going to have over your renderings. And a touch up, I'm going to run it quickly, you know, these are the uh, illustrated decal image, this little sticker thingy. It will really give you uh, additional details over the model. You see all these little tiny decals going over across the model, right? It's going to give you a realistic feeling to it. Now, this 06, whatever it is, right? I don't know what it's a fusion, whatever. You know, this is a texture, you know, or decal. It's a combination. And then, yeah, I like it. The th original 3D data is a completely smooth, flat, pure, solid data. But just because of the mixture of texture and the decal, it looks like really damaged, you know? Yep. And uh, also, uh, just uh, one little tip, you, as you should change the uh, focal length so that you can have a better look in renderings. And uh, by changing the focal length, this is like a, a example, box example from MathBook. Right? It's really like 90 degrees, but in the reality, you, you should see object more like perspective. So not too strong, but probably 55 focal lengths will give you the good range of the perspective. And also don't forget to move this tiny arrow to the right so that you can have a longer, tar a longer rendering time to have a better quality. And uh, this is the final set. You know, this is me and my colleague being in Paris, you know, in Eiffel Tower. I really like enjoying being in pa Paris because it's got nice architects. And I really felt that I wanted to place car in front of this, whatever the building, you know, I don't know. So I took that photo, you know, with my iPhone. This is iPhone photo. And I took my Insta, uh, 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 what is it, Insta360. Right, 360 photo, this is me and my colleague, you know, Insta 361, by the way, to be precise, 6K. And then I placed it, I mixed it, you know. You know, I really like the fact that this environment is reflecting exactly on the model. So there's no mismatch between background and uh, reflections. And uh, with the Fusion, you can create great, great renderings and I want you to just play with it, be good at it, and present your great ideas to others through fusion renderings so that you can uh, communicate with others with your design thinking and design ideas. And by the way, this, by taking, uh, what is it, Q QR code with your smartphone, you should be able to download these images. So when it goes to the YouTube or some like uh, video site, then you should watch my video again and take this uh, QR code with your smartphone so that you can get these files. All right, so thank you. Sorry, I just over probably 10 minutes, but hopefully it's within a range. It's totally all right, Yuji, and thank you so much for taking time. I know there's a pri uh, time difference also in as that of India and Japan time. So really appreciate your presence with us today. Thank you. Now it's 3 a.m. here in Japan. I'm like, Come I'm on. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is time. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. And I'll meet with you on Monday. Thanks again. Thanks, Yuji. Thanks, Samar. And thanks, Anand, for yeah. being very active on the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you Bye. all. Yeah, thank you all. Bye. Bye.